morning, church. Good to see you this morning. Welcome to Aurora United Methodist Church on this beautiful Sunday. I know it's cold, but it's lovely, isn't it? I love the sky this time of year. It's absolutely gorgeous, especially at night. If you ever go walking at night, the stars are amazing around here. So welcome to be giving yourselves to worship today. I hope you all brought your card. You are getting back to church card so that you can get it punched. If you don't have one, there are extras on the table out there and the whole punch is there. Remember, after seven times of coming to church, you will receive a, another special motivator to keep you coming to worship Sunday after Sunday. So be sure to track your attendance on our Get Back cards. Thank you for being here again today. A couple of announcements. Um, please sign in on the attendance sheets, the red pads that are in the pews. And I would invite those who are joining us online today to go ahead and leave a comment, maybe just jot a little hello or a, a praise the Lord or something to let us know that you are, are watching or a part of the part of the worshiping community today. I want to say that um, tomorrow the Blood Mobile will be here. Some of you um, already know that because you may have already made an appointment, but it is an important time for our community and an important time for our nation as um, if you are able to come to, sh to give blood, that's a really important thing, especially right now. I have seen many calls for an urgent need for blood to be given, so I went, you know, invite you to come and be a part of that. Um, also, and Sandy doesn't know this yet, but the office will be closed tomorrow in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so um, Pastor Greg and I will probably be here off and on, but the office will be closed just for your information. Also, uh, big news, next Sunday is Youth Sunday. So you know what that means. That means we're going to have a whole bunch of kids up here that are going to be sharing their music, their talents, their witness, uh, their time with you. They have planned the worship service and they are ready to, to lead. And so um, I invite you to come back next Sunday and to or to watch if you need to next Sunday to be a part of that wonderful worship service that they offer us. And they will both be here in Aurora and then they will go and uh, lead worship in Bradshaw as well. So thank you to the youth who are working on that and, and uh, paying attention to our worship needs. Thank you for that. If there are no other announcements, we're going to move directly to the call to worship. I invite you to stand as you are able. Join me in this ancient prayer. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long you are working for good in the world. You have sustained us through the darkness. And let us pray together. Holy God, stir up in us desire to serve you, to live peacefully with our neighbors, and to devote each day to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remain standing as you are able as we uh, join in an opening song. Come, Christians, join to sing.
I'd invite the young people who are with us today to come up for a moment for our young disciples. I have a couple of things here to show you. Let's see. I don't want to spill anything. Okay. Pretty cool. Oh, they're being shy today. Oh, tricky, tricky. But can you see? Can you see? I can see you. I can see you out there. I can see you. That's okay. Well then, I'll stand. <laughs> All right. Somebody tell me what this is. A pie plate, right? Unfortunately, it's empty. Mm, too bad, right? Because pie is delicious. One of the best foods in the whole wide world. And I wanted to say to you something very important that every Christian should know. Every follower of God should know this. God is not like pie. Say it with me. God is not like pie. God is not like pie. Because with a pie, you have probably eight pieces. I mean, you can cut smaller ones if you want. And when you take a piece, there's a little less. And then somebody else takes a piece and there's a little less. And somebody else takes a piece and there's a little less. And pretty soon, it's just like this. It's empty. No more pie. God is not like that. God can't be emptied out is what I mean. So here's another experiment to show you what I do mean. What I have, oh, maybe I'll use the pie plate. That would be good. All right. Who's going who's gonna to be my holder? I need somebody else to hold. Oh, here we go. Kathy will help. All right, Kathy. You're going to hold the pie plate with this glass of water. Because this is a good illustration, a better illustration, probably not perfect, but a better illustration of what God's love is like. More like this glass of water that seems pretty full. It's pretty full. You could probably put a little more in there. But what's going to happen, kids, when I put some heavy things in it. These are shells. Oh, it lifted it up a little bit. How about some of these flat ones? That didn't raise it up too much. Oh, a little bit, a little bit more. There's a little bit more. What is going to happen, Miss Kathy? You think the water's going to come over the top? If this is like God's love, What if I put one real big heavy one in there? Whoop, there it went. It just spills over the top. And I could keep adding. I could put little pebbles. I could put grains of sand. And the water just keeps coming and flowing and sharing. That is more what God's love is like. Something that pours out. Something that spills over when more is added to it rather than empties out when more happens to it. So I encourage us all to remember that God's love overflows. The more people there are, the more people there are for God to love. It doesn't take away from the love that God has for any one of us when more are added. Let's have a prayer. It's a repeat after me moment. I'll invite you to join me. Dear God, thank you for your love, which overflows and can't be emptied. Help us to remember that your love is for us, but it's also for everyone else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me in prayer.
Karen again earlier this morning for letting me jump in to sing. I appreciate that. I don't get to, I don't sing as much anymore as I used to, and uh, it's nice to jump in every now and again and offer my voice. So thank you for listening to my little, <laughs> little voice. And thank you, choir, and those words about being with God and God being with us and um, the, the constancy of God is going to come up later in the service. So I appreciated how those things melted together, what I'm thinking about sharing with you, as well as what the choir was singing. Um, a couple of folks to lift up as we come to a time of prayer together. First of all, for all of those in our community and in other communities where um, more folks are in the hospital and more folks are sick, and quarantining and masking and going through those um, COVID precautions once again. Um, it has not gone away. I know there are some churches that, um, not in our area that I know of, but I, I know some that I know of in Kansas and other places that I kind of keep in touch with that are closing and going into online only again for the safety of their people and their congregations. So pray for those folks who um, are unable to be in worship today who uh, would like to be, and maybe they're really missing it, but um, you know, we have we, we have online, so here we are, and I pray that everyone watching and, and surrounded by God's love today feels that, whether they can be present in the flesh or not at their church and in their particular pew. I wanna lift up the family of artist Dunsmore. Artist passed away and her service was um, just a few days ago on Friday. Um, blessings and thanks to Reverend Mary Scott who led the worship service and the funeral message and everything. She uh, knew the Dunsmores very well, and was related in fact, and uh, she did a wonderful job in sharing um, the celebration of life for artists. So please be in prayer for Jeff and uh, the family. I know a lot of you remember them and artists helping with children's Christmas programs and a lot of things that happened here in the church when they were living here in Aurora. Uh, lift up in prayer Roseanne Meyer, who was in the hospital last week. Keep her in your prayers. Also Don Tuttle, who was in the hospital some time ago. Keep him in your prayers. Again, all those who are struggling or suffering um, during this season where there isn't just one illness, but most people I know that when they get sick, they go to the doctor, they get tested for three or four different things that are running around and that they may have. I heard one uh, teacher say there were 14 teachers gone in her school in Grand Island on, on one day. Wow, so it's a, it's a struggle. Lifting up those folks who are caring for us, those teachers, as well as our healthcare professionals this morning. Let's take a few moments to pray together. Will you bow your heads with me? Holy and gracious God, you have given us this morning as a gift. Every morning, every day, every moment that we are breathing in and out, we are gifted with your love. It doesn't matter, God, that you love everyone. It doesn't take away from the love that you have for me. So let's not be fearful before God. Let our faith be strong and our knowledge of how God's love works in the world be strong so that we can stand before God knowing that the light never gets overcome by darkness. Remembering that the light that we have in Jesus Christ is so great that we do not have to be afraid. We do not have to worry. God, we are mindful of all of the times that Jesus led us with his stories, with his words, with his teachings. We remember all of these lessons that we bring with us, the scripture verses that we've memorized. We bring with us all the lessons that we were taught in Sunday school and vacation Bible school. And we, we remember them in our hearts and we know that they are written there. And that's all that you ask of us, that we write you, God, on our hearts that we won't have to say, I need to know the Lord because we already know you. 
you are known through us because it's it's our lives that reflect your love it's our lives that we carry in our lives that we carry on the gift of Jesus Christ we are his hands and his feet we are his body so we ask that you would bless us bless those who are not here who are missing us bless those who are here bless your church universal all over the world and include those saints that are among us in the great cloud of witnesses. Bless us all to be strong and to walk faithfulness and in truth towards your light, into your love. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. wish we would have had a lot more rain <laughs> last week. Um, our trees in the garden could use more rain. We keep going out there, Jim and I, with our five-gallon buckets and dumping water on those trees. But in a couple of years, we're going to have some apples and pears, and that's going to be pretty amazing to give away. So um, we have been looking at the beginnings of our faith, the book of beginnings, Genesis, the stories and the sagas, the tales from the beginning of our, our word of God, our book, the Bible, that um, lay a foundation for all that is to come. And uh, we've, we've covered a little bit of ground here. We're not too far into this sermon series. Um, I'm in the fourth chapter in Genesis, and we're going to talk about Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel, I want to say, are uh, an introduction of something, not a summation or an ending of something. They're, they're just the introduction to the many, many times in the Bible that brother will go up against brother. And of course, I'm using brother as the all-inclusive brother, brothers and sisters, all of humanity. So think of Cain and Abel as kind of a model story or maybe the prototype story, a beginning story, Genesis means beginning, of conflict between people in our world. So this is Genesis 4. I'm going to start with um, verse 2b, the second part of, of verse 2, and then continue from there. Let's listen together for the word of God. Abel cared for the flocks, and Cain farmed the fertile land. Sometime later, Cain presented an offering to the Lord from the land's crop, while Abel presented his flock's oldest offspring with their fat. The Lord looked favorably on Abel and his sacrifice, but didn't look favorably on Cain and his sacrifice. Cain became very angry and looked resentful. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why do you look so resentful? If you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door ready to strike. It will entice you but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? The Lord said, what did you do? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So you have heard from both Greg and I, I think, and if you've watched our face, my Facebook page, you've seen pictures. We have a new dog. 
<laughs> We've been sharing this little bit of news that we have a dog and we talk about the dog a lot because it's new and fresh and it's, you know, something fun in our lives. And we love him so much, he's so cute. <laughs> okay, so we have a new dog. <laughs> I bought a toy bone, you know, a little chewy thing for the dog. His name is Boo, our little Boo. So I bought, I bought him a little bone. Greg also went and bought a chew toy bone for Boo, and we both gave him our toys. And guess what? The dog prefers the toy that I gave him. He does not prefer the chew bone that Greg gave him. Huh. What do you know about that? The dog prefers the one I gave, but doesn't look favorably on Greg's gift. Sound familiar? They say there is something to the way that the word dog has the same letters as the word God. Greg's actually going to talk about this again next week and have a little more to add to this part of the thought. Now, we have no idea why the dog liked one bone and not the other, one toy and not the other. We don't know why God chose one offering over the other. You may have heard other preachers or other teachers say that somehow Cain didn't get his offering right, that he didn't present his best. It also really doesn't say that Abel presented his best. And this translation says he presented the oldest of his flocks, while some might say the oldest would be the easiest to give up. The ones that are almost gone anyway, oh, just I'll take these and give them to God. There's really nothing in this account to indicate that God is going to discriminate or prefer one offering to the other. Nothing there, it's just that Abel gave one thing, Cain gave another thing, and that's all it says. You know, the text doesn't say what it doesn't say. It doesn't say one was better than the other. It just doesn't say that. Does God like me more or pay more attention to me or protect me from harm or somehow favor me because of what offering I give? No. The dog loves Greg. The the dog wants Greg's companionship and love and pets and excitement and playing and all of that stuff. The God wants him just as much, regardless of the toy that was dropped in front of him. He still wants to be Greg's best friend. Just as God loves each of us freely and unconditionally and wholly, no matter what. Now, Cain has not understood this about God. <coughs> Hence his anger and frustration, downcast face, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> resentment. See, God has to be free. God has to be free to act regardless of our actions or our gifts or our plans or our behaviors. Otherwise, we would have some kind of power over God, wouldn't we? We don't. We don't have power of any kind over God. Those who worshipped idols believed differently. They believed that they could influence their God. They could bring in particular gifts of a particular kind at a particular place at a particular time. If I do it exactly the right way, then I'm going to please this God and the rain's going to fall or whatever's going to happen. It's going to, you know, this good thing will all follow because of what they do for that God. I don't want a God that can be bought. I don't want a God that can be bought. That God would be a reflection of me and my price rather than me being a reflection of God made in the image of God, reflecting the goodness of God. This is not a lesson about what you offer God. There are no less than 10 other Bible verses 
that I quickly found that support this, that our offerings are not the thing that God is ultimately looking for. Psalm 40, you, God, don't relish my sacrifices and my burnt offerings, but you have given me ears to hear you and a heart that desires you. Psalm 50, I don't need your offerings, God says, because everything on this earth already belongs to me. The animals and the plants and the grain and the bees, they're already mine. Psalm 51, God, you don't need my sacrifices. You want my humble heart. Isaiah, God says, I'm tired of offerings that don't mean anything. What I want for you is to seek good and to do justice in the world. Micah echoes that sometime later. What I want for you is to seek kindness and justice and humility. How about those things for an offering? Hosea 6, what God desires is faithful love and knowledge of God, not sacrifices. Jeremiah says, go ahead, burn up your offerings, but eat them yourselves. God says, I want you to be my people. I want to have you in my, my heart. I want you to be in my heart and mine to be in yours. And Amos says, I hate your offerings, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You see, this is not a lesson about what kind of offering we bring to God, grain or sheep or how much money you bring or if you give it all in one lump sum or willy-nilly whenever you think about it or maybe you're careful to place your offering check in that plate week by week. Don't tell the finance committee I just said your offering didn't matter. <laughs> Some of them might be here. We take all kinds of offerings, of course, of course. But this story about Cain and Abel is not about one was better and one was not. This is not also, uh, this is not a lesson about murder. This is not. Um, we don't need an epic biblical saga about one brother taking another's life to tell us that murder is wrong. We should know this. If we don't know that before we read the Bible, the world might be in real trouble. But I think it's pretty instinctual. There are dire circumstances, but in general, most people are born and taught to know we don't kill other people. But we have in Cain and Abel's troubled story is a clue to what God is going to do now that we are really out of paradise. You know, we haven't gone far out of the garden. We're just east of Eden. You might remember Steinbeck's novel. And what are we supposed to learn now that we're growing this family of God, this humanity that God has created? Maybe it's that the stakes are really high in this place outside the garden. That there's life and death, and that there is going to be blood crying out from the fields. Which speaks louder to you? Which brother speaks louder to you? Is it the sin of Cain that leaves you thinking, or is it the blood of Abel? The sin of Cain or the blood of Abel? Sin is presented here not exactly like we had it in the garden. It's not tricky or crafty, as the text says. It's not like the snake in the garden, but sin is like an elusive threat, ready to strike at any time. And so you think, well, how can I avoid it? If, it's, if I can't see it coming, if it's like lurking right there, do I have to live with sin like I'm in some sort of horror movie? And this is really why I don't watch horror movies. Suspenseful music building and building and building. And you know it's coming and you know something's gonna jump out and in every dark corner you're looking going, what's there, what's there, what's there? Every noise, a jump. Do we have to live like that? I hope not. I would have the covers over my head all of the time. I have to do that all of the time anyway when I watch TV and movies because I'm not great with things that jump out at me. Do I have to live with sin like that? Also says sin is something that will entice us. 
will lure us in, pull you. A siren song that lulls and numbs. The red of the stove that you can't help but touch. Sin is like that. Well, it's in his book, East of Eden, that Steinbeck notices something really interesting about what's happening with sin and what God says about sin. If you, if you read this translation, it says you must overcome sin. And others say that too. But if you go back to the King James Version, you know, the old one that a lot of people grew up with, the thou shalt and all that, it isn't you must overcome, it's you shall overcome. And you can read that like a promise. A promise. You shall overcome it. Not command. Another version actually does read, you can overcome sin. You are not lost. God has given us a way to feel safe from the stalking beast of sin. God gives us hope that we won't always follow the siren song and lose our way. We have the ability and the power, oh yes, here we do have power to keep our hands to ourselves and not touch that hot thing. Yes, Cain sins and we will sin, but there's that promise. We have the power to overcome it. Does the sin of Cain speak to you? Or is it the blood of Abel crying out from the, from the ground? It is a happy coincidence. I didn't notice this when I was planning worship and we were picking sermons. And I chose to, to preach on Cain and Abel. I like the more difficult stories. <laughs> and it's not an easy one to, to mess with. But I like the ones that I can mess with. But that this falls just a day before Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Human Relations Day in the United Methodist Church. We'll take an offering sometime this month or in the next few weeks. It's a day to remember God's preference for justice rather than offerings. We just heard all of that from Isaiah and Micah and Hosea and Amos and all that. To remember God's preference for justice rather than Offerings, Because for some of us, it is the blood of Abel that carries the bulk of the lesson of these two brothers. In fact, I really like the NIV translation, New International Version translation, of that particular line about God hearing the blood of Abel. It says, listen, listen. Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me. A command. Listen, because we can hear it too. It's not just God that can hear and see and comprehend injustice. We can hear it too. Listen. A life with our brothers and sisters outside of the garden is not lived in a void or in a silo. You know, it's not, here's this group of people in this silo, and they don't interact with this group in this silo, and they don't interact with this. That's not how it is. That's not what this lesson is teaching us. We're not apart from one another, and we're not apart from God either. We're in relationship with our brothers and sisters and with God. I think of it like a triangle. God, me, everyone else. And it's a big relationship. And they're all connected. It's not a dotted line. It's a big solid line. Chief Seattle said it this way. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. It's all connected. John Wesley said, summarizing here, faith goes two ways, towards God and towards one another. We have personal piety, our worship of God, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and we have social justice. We have how we listen to the people of the world who need 
justice. Jesus said it this way, many ways, love one another as I have loved you. When you do justice, when you clothe the naked and you feed the hungry and you welcome the stranger and visit those who are in prison, then you do it for me. You love God and you love neighbor. He said everything else hangs on those two commands. He said it in a lot of ways. For some of us, the lesson from Cain and Abel, these two brothers, about, is about listening for injustice, for hearing and seeing what God hears and what God sees, because now we are the body of Christ, as the mystic says. We are his eyes. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his heart. Last week, I listened um, to a funeral online, a funeral for uh, Reverend Dr. Dick Turner. Doesn't he have some relationship with this church in the past? Yes, yes, Dick Turner he passed away. His funeral was in Lincoln a couple of weeks ago, week, maybe Monday, no, last Saturday. We couldn't go, so I got online. Isn't that nice? I can get online and go listen and be a part of it even though I wasn't physically there. Anyway, I went online and I was listening to the folks who were who were talking. Dick was the, the one who appointed me to, gave me the phone call and said, won't you come to Nebraska? Won't you come to Lincoln, Nebraska, Michelle, and serve at a full-time church in Lincoln? And uh, such a great man, such a wonderful friend. And my, my, friend, my other friend, Don Bredauer, who's from Omaha area, a longtime pastor there. He's uh, also very well known for um, listening to folks and for spiritual direction. He was speaking at the funeral, and he was sharing his memories and his thoughts, and he said something that really surprised me. I mean, it really caught me off guard. I paused the video. Thank goodness for the pause button. I paused the video, and I wrote it down real quickly right there on a piece of paper that I had been working on on my desk. I had to write it down. It surprised me. But it struck me as particularly relevant in this tragedy of Cain and Abel. He said, God protects us from nothing, but sustains us in everything. God protects us from nothing, but sustains us in everything. How wise. Cain was not protected from his own rage, his own anger. God gave him the freedom to choose just as God is free to choose. God did not protect Abel from the abuse. There must be free will in humanity. There is no godly finger, hand coming down from heaven, moving people here and there, positioning us where we should be or maybe where we shouldn't be in order for this or that to the other thing happens. That's not how it works. God protects us from nothing. There are consequences for our choices. Though there are paths that we choose that lead this way or that way towards God or away from God, God walks with us nonetheless. God won't ever leave us. Even Cain, at his very worst, was never abandoned by God. We got a letter this week, a couple of letters, for the fourth and fifth graders who put together little sacks that had socks and candy bars and ramen noodles and things for the people at the jail here at Hamilton County. We got a letter <laughs> thanking us, names of real people saying, no one ever thinks of us. Thank you for that gift. It gave me hope. Don't stop doing this. Don't stop spreading hope into the community, into the world. We are here. And they got a little taste of they're not abandoned by God. Now, confession is something that we don't do every day or every week in the United Methodist tradition. Some churches might do that every week. We haven't been in the practice of that in our church, in our congregation. But I want to take a moment now, in light of Cain and Abel and their plight, 
the beginning of this story of conflict and sin in our world. And take a moment now to think about, is there a torn relationship in your life? What is the sin that troubles you? What regret do you have for some injustice against your neighbor? Think about those things. Talk them over with God. Give those things to God and know that God is with you still. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are prone to become angry. We are prone to be resentful. We are afraid of sin that is right around the corner waiting for us. Help us to remember that you are always with us. Your steadfast love will never, ever abandon us. We pray it in the name and light of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now our hymn reminds us of what I've just spoken for a long time. <laughs> we'll sing in a couple of verses that we are near to the heart of God. I invite you to stand as you are able. to uh, bring around the offering plates for that offering that I told you God doesn't care about, but that we care about. <laughs> um, and then if we have a young person who'd like to come up and, and uh, hold the church for the children's offering, you can do that, or I'll just set it right here.
please as you are able. us that we are the ones to take the light of Christ into the world. Why don't you continue to stand as you are able and join as we sing. face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. 